Hi everyone and welcome to CubeTube. Today we are going to discuss another element. So here we go. And the element of today is plutonium. And specifically, trinitite. Now, I'm wondering what that is. I hope you do too. Um, but let's first, as we unpack this box, ask ourselves the question, was the creation of this element a mistake? Was it a human error that should not have uh, should not have taken place well we answer that question at the end of the episode um, if, as far as we can of course but what do we got here now hey there's actually something in there i thought maybe i would get a placeholder but no this is beautiful so what do we got here so it is element 94 it has 244 mass its letters are pu yeah we get to that later and it looks like a like a rock a little bit of greenish kind of rock it's nice i love it okay so let's put it in here let's put it in there well so my editor will be happy with me this time so here we go put it in the middle because there was also a comment yeah, that looks good. Okay, so here we go. 94 protons, 94 electrons. The main bunch of isotopes, uh, for instance, plutonium 238, 239, 240, 241, 242, and 244. It belongs in uh, the seventh period, and it has a melting point of 640 degrees Celsius. It is a silvery white met Wait, this is not a silvery white metal. So, what is this then? Well, in this acrylic cube, and it also said on the package, is trinitite. And trinitite is a mineral that was formed after the first atomic explosion that, was, that ever took place. Um, at, uh, the, well, man-made atomic explosion, of course. Uh, at Alamogordo, during the Manhattan Project in 1945. And if I understand correctly, not all plutonium exploded in the first test. Particles um, that did not explode melted together with the sand that was blown up during the test. And this resulted in the fallout of the silicon uh, from the sand and the plutonium, causing this kind of greenish glass rocky besides, yeah, glass rocky substance. And if you seen the movie Oppenheimer, I, and if you didn't see the movie Oppenheimer, I definitely recommend you to uh, to watch it because that basically is also a little bit about this element and how it was created. Uh, well, not necessarily about how this element was created, but yeah, um, you can see the events um, that basically caused this to uh, to uh, occur. Now um, uh, there is more. Uh, in there besides plutonium uh, there were all kinds of fission pro uh, uh, products after the trinitite uh, trinity test and in this trinitite there were very likely also other fission uh, products but uh, yeah they were highly radioactive and more highly radioactive something is most of the time it decays quite quickly and it was such a long time ago I mean, 1945, that by now all the really heavy radioactive stuff has decayed. And what we're left with is this weakly radioactive uh, uh, plutonium uh, bit. I think it's really cool because besides an element, this is just a piece of history. I'm really happy with this one. And um, thanks, Engineered Labs, for, uh, for sending this one again to me. Um, it is an element that was first created in... Uh, 1940 and it occurs in very small quantities in nature now when uh, when it occurs in nature it's probably trapped between uranium 238 and captured between some some neurons maybe and neutrons maybe um, however the amount of natural protonium on earth is estimated to be only a few grams so yeah it's really hard to to find that uh, it also sometimes occurs in really small quantities in meteorites and humans have added, well, hundreds and hundreds of tons to that gr few grams. Now, 
Um, it was first discovered in the cyclotron at the University in Berkeley, California, by Glenn T. Seaborg. And hey, we remember him from the episode of last week. And if you want to know more about uh, uh, Seaborgium, the element that was named after him, or Glenn T. Seaborg, watch the episode from last week. Um, so, how did they create this element? Well, they, they did this by bombarding uranium with deuterons and neutrons. Now, what is a deuteron? Uh, a deuteron is a particle consisting of a proton and a neutron. Now, we know uh, hydrogen, and hydrogen had only one proton and one electron. Now, it doesn't have a neutron, but you can add neutrons to hydrogen. And if you do that and you strip away the electron, which is possible, that's when you get a deuteron. So a deuteron is basically a particle of a proton and a neutron without the electron. Now, what they did is they, so they bombarded the uh, uranium with those particles. And eventually, an element was formed which was called Neptunian-238. But that is a very unstable element and that immediately decayed into, or very uh, afterwards decayed into plutonium-238 in 1943. Um, it was isolated and chemically characterized, um, which is basically mean the properties were determined. And that was, uh, like I said, in, in, in 1943. Um, so the first experiment were done in 1940. And in 1943, they, uh, they isolated the, uh, uh, the, the real element. Uh, the element is named after Pluto, uh, which, um, uh, yeah, but why is it then not called PL and is it called PU? Well, um, here's the story. Scientists are sometimes accused of lacking a sense of humor. Well, uh, Glenn T. Seawork was a little bit of a different scientist in that way. So he thought it was funny to use the letters PU. Now, PU, uh, for, for the Americans uh, 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 that, are, that are watching, you may know this, but because children say that when they find something disgusting. Um, so this is basically what, what Seaborg did and why he chose those letters and expected a lot of resistance. But the letters were simply, um, like I said, since scientists sometimes have a little bit of lacking sense of humor, uh, they just simply accepted the letters. Um, special properties. Uh, it is a relatively low melting point, uh, but an unusually high boiling point of 3,228 degrees Celsius. Then we get to the point, what can you do with it? Well, less than you think, but it's still quite significant for the things that we do. Um, so let's start with nuclear batteries. Um, now, what is a nuclear battery? Well, uh, plutonium-238 generates quite a lot of heat in really small amounts due to its radioactive decay. Plutonium-238 has a half-time of 87 years, and the amount of energy that is released during radioactive decay is so great that it also produces around 560 watts per kilogram. The density of the element is also very high, so a kilogram would fit in a shot glass of 50 milliliters. So it's, it's really dense. My soldering iron, to give an example, iron, which uses 10 watts um, and has a tip that reaches roughly around 300 degrees. Now, that 10 watts could already be provided by one gram of plutonium-238, roughly the size of the tip. So a soldering iron with a plutonium tip would stay warm for 87 years. The heat can be converted uh, into an electric... Uh, electricity via a thermal electric element. Now, these convert heat into electricity. Now, how does that work? Well, when you bring two different metals into contact, there is a voltage difference. Um, and because they don't pull, uh, the reason for that is that they don't pull equally hard on the free moving electrons. Now, that causes some flow to one to the other, uh, to, but yeah, it, it doesn't really yeah, it, it, it doesn't flow close enough. So you always have to go to a similar state, transition. So it's not really useful as a battery. Now, however, the voltage difference um, is temperature dependent. So at the higher temperatures, the electrons will move faster and spread more evenly, um, regardless of how hard the metals pull on them. 
So if you keep a junction, uh, one junction at a different temperature as the other, for instance, in a ring where you have half iron, half copper, a current will start to flow because of that temperature difference. Now, this is called a thermocouple. The generated voltage is very low, but if you increase it by connecting many of these elements in series, um, alternating pieces of iron with copper in a zigzag pattern, so one cell can use the plutonium to keep it warm, and the other ones can be kept cold by, um, uh, by, by, cold, uh, by, by cooling fins, yeah, then you can keep the current flowing. Now, this is very useful in space because it's really difficult to, uh, in a vacuum of space, create the right circumstances for a battery. And you always have problems with weight and stuff like that. So this is what they use it for. Um, they use this for satellites. They use it uh, for energy cells that are used for lunar, lunar uh, seismic measurement stations. And they used it for the Voyagers that were launched in the 1970s. Those are exploring uh, satellites or, or basically uh, spaceships that were sent uh, into the solar system to explore. Now, spaceships like spacecraft like Voyager have been traveling for so long that the power of their energy cells is now really starting to slowly deplete. It can also be used, so plutonium can also be used for fuel cells in nuclear reactors. Um, for this, plutonium oxide is often used, and it is also possible to use uh, carbides, nitrides, or carbonitrides for this purpose. Uh, partially, uh, particularly isotopes plutonium 239 and 241 are suitable for this. Now, another thing that you can use plutonium for is uh, energy production via a breeder reactor. Now, the fission of uh, uranium-235 and plutonium-239, um, in that fission process, there are so many neutrons are released that apart from the neutron that is needed to sustain the chain reaction, um, and despite the inevitable technical losses that you have of, uh, of neutrons, on average, more than one uranium-238 atom absorbs a neutron from uh, plutonium-239. You then create more fuel than you use, which is, well, extraordinary. And it allows you to be ultimately use all of the uranium-238 for energy production. And there is about 140 times more uranium-238 than... Um, uh, uranium-235. Now the problem is that when you do this, you allow plutonium to circulate in such large quantities that it becomes ridiculously easy to divert it to make a bomb. And this is basically what those reactors are being used for. Um, and then we get to, well, the most important thing that people know that uh, plutonium does, and that is it yeah, it, it's, it's used uh, as a destructive force. Uh, over the years, hundreds of tons of plutonium have been produced for nuclear weapons. A nuclear weapon only requires 5.6 kilograms of critical mass, which is, well, 8 centimeters, 8.2 centimeters sphere. So it's really small. The explosion from this is roughly equi equivalent to 100 million kilograms of TNT. Now, then we get back to the question. It's been a long episode. Um... What was the discovery of this element? Can we consider it a mistake that we, sh that we should have not done this? Well, to be honest, this is classified as a somewhat unscientific question. Uh, science doesn't talk about these things like that. And it's more of a philosophical question or a moral question. Um, if we ask, however, does plutonium have enough other uses than bombs? I would say yes. Uh, I mean, the energy cells for satellites, the, um, yeah, it's, it's useful. Uh, it also has the nuclear reactors. Um, they fulfilled its role as CO neutral options. Uh, and in the effort growing demand for energy, um, yeah, it plays its part. But then of course, there is always this thing, um, which is July 16th, um, 1945, Los Alamos at 529. The moment this piece of 
rock or mineral have has been created. I still I find it really amazing and astonishing if I think about it. This moment, however, was and especially the two bombs that fell after that, uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, completely changed the world uh, from that moment on. It became clear that humanity was from that moment on capable of destroying a global civilization as we know it. No other creature on earth seemed to be capable of causing itself so much harm uh, until then. Now, the genie cannot be put back in the bottle. You cannot forget uh, what you can do with plutonium. And so therefore we will have to learn with the consequences like a, like a child who burns their hand on the stove. It's not so, yeah, it's not really a, um, yeah, let's, let's put it this way, a, um, a happy end to the, uh, to the episode, but I still hope you guys liked it. If you think I missed anything about plutonium, let me know in the comments. And yeah, if, um, if you like this video, like and, uh, and subscribe. Thank you very much. See you next week.